preacher, Unitarian preacher, William Henry Channing. <clears throat> it's called My Symphony. To live content with small means, to seek elegance rather than luxury, and refinement rather than fashion, to be worthy, not respectable, and wealthy, not rich, to listen to stars and birds, babes and sages with open heart, to study hard, think quietly, act frankly, talk gently, await occasions, hurry never. In a word, to let the spiritual, unbidden and unconscious, grow up through the common. This is to be my symphony. <clears throat> so what message would you share with a congregation of people that you knew and loved if you knew it would be your last message to them before you died? <clears throat> That's the dilemma that the Reverend Forrest Church faced some years back. For many years, Forrest was the minister of one of the largest Unitarian churches in the country, All Souls Church, on Manhattan's Upper East Side. In addition to being a pastor and preacher, Forrest was a scholar and, and writer. After earning his PhD right here at the Divinity School, he went on to author more than 20 books of religious history, theology, and spiritual wisdom. <clears throat> I met Forrest soon after I began my ministry at All Souls Church in Washington, D.C. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> And I'll always be grateful for the, the support and encourage he, encouragement he offered me when I was young and new to ministry. One of the things I admired most about Forrest, one of his great gifts for the ministry, was his ability to share with his congregation lessons that he'd learned from his own failings and struggles in life. He spoke openly and vulnerably, for instance, about his struggle with alcoholism and the lessons he learned in recovery. <clears throat> and in 2006, after he was diagnosed with esophageal cancer, he often preached and wrote about the humble but profound lessons he learned as he confronted his mortality. Forrest kept preaching and writing throughout his several year struggle with cancer. <clears throat> but eventually his treatment stopped working. The tumors grew. And in the summer of 2009, just weeks before he died, <clears throat> Forrest preached what he knew would be his final sermon. He called this sermon the summer of our content, a riff on Shakespeare's line about the winter of our discontent. <clears throat> and in that sermon, he shared a simple mantra, <clears throat> a mantra that had helped guide him through many highs and lows in his own life, and that now at the end helped him look back on his life with a feeling of contentment. His message to them in that last sermon, his mantra was this, want what you have, do what you can, and be who you are. <clears throat> now on the surface, this might seem like simple or even simplistic advice. In a world of trouble, are we even allowed to feel something like contentment? And when our lives feel so complicated and harried, could it really be as simple as want what you have, do what you can, and be who you are? <clears throat> Yet when you start to unpack this mantra, what you find is an invitation to a life of gratitude and purpose and self-acceptance. 
Spending time with Forest Mantra has enriched my own life. And in this new year, when so often we spend time criticizing, scrutinizing, and assessing our lives, <clears throat> and making resolutions for how we're going to change going forward, I thought it might serve us well to begin instead with this message of gratitude and self-acceptance. So over the course of my next three sermons, <clears throat> I'm going to take these invitations one by one and try to unpack for us some of their wisdom, beginning with this week's message. <clears throat> Want what you have. Now, why in the world would a guy dying from cancer preach, want what you have? <clears throat> Forrest acknowledged in this apparent irony in his sermon and explained that want what you have doesn't mean wanting cancer <clears throat> or wanting to die. It's not about talking ourselves into desiring something we don't or shouldn't desire. And it also doesn't mean resigning ourselves to fate unless resignation is appropriate. For Forrest, want what you have meant something else. Something closely tied to his understanding of what prayer was. <clears throat> Forrest believed in prayer but he also believed we should be careful about what we pray for. <laughs> kind of like that guy in the story earlier today, right? <clears throat> Some of our prayers, he said, amount to nothing more than wishful thinking. All right? Prayers for things we don't have and are unlikely ever to receive, <clears throat> like winning the lottery. While there might be times in our lives when such wishful thinking is called for, to structure our prayer life around such wishes can create a habit of desiring things that are unattainable. Such prayers can be a setup for disappointment and discontent, even ingratitude, right? Because wishful thinking can sometimes blind us to the blessings that are already abundant in our lives. Instead of wishful thinking, Forrest counseled thoughtful wishing. <laughs> and he unpacked this distinction between the two in his last sermon. He said, look, if you're healthy, then pray for health. What a blessing health is and how rarely we get to give thanks for it while we are fortunate enough to possess it. On the other hand, he continued, now that I've lost my health, I could waste my time praying for a miracle to reverse what I know to be true and what's coming. <clears throat> Oops. But how much better it is, he said, to bathe in the glow of having my fondest prayers instantly answered. To pray, for instance, for the gift of my children, my wife, my friends, as for your problems, he continued, you, know, you might remember to pray for the sympathy of those who are concerned about your plight, for the love and care of those around you. What could be finer or what prayer more welcomely answered? <clears throat> pray for what you have, church said, and, in your, and then your prayers will always be answered. <laughs> <clears throat> now, if it sounds like a tautology, it's because it is. <laughs> But it's also more than that. Because when we pray for what we have, desire what we have, want what we already have, what we're doing is cultivating a habit of gratitude for the blessings of our lives. <clears throat> Count your blessings, Church told his congregation as he lay dying. Want what you have. Now, I wonder if we can apply this teaching in our own lives. <clears throat> we all struggle with challenges. Perhaps, like Forrest, we face illness or declining health <clears throat> or a daunting prognosis. Or maybe we're struggling with a relationship at work or at home. 
<clears throat> in the context of the struggles of our own lives, where might the distinction lie in your life between wishful thinking and thoughtful wishing? What prayers of ours are already answered if only we would utter them? And how might we, even in the face of struggle and hardship, find regular opportunities to count the blessings of our lives? <clears throat> Friends, have you ever considered how much time we spend wanting what we don't have? A lot. <laughs> <clears throat> and have you ever considered how much suffering this can cause in your life? Consider the time we, absorb, we spend absorbing corporate advertising, whose sole purpose is to create in us a desire for something we don't already have. Or how about the time we spend on social media <clears throat> giving away our precious attention to the perfect lives that others portray on Instagram or Facebook, right? It's easy to become jealous of what we perceive as the blessings of others' lives covetous of things we don't and will never possess. We get this grass is always greener kind of attitude. <laughs> Remember Gollum from the Lord of the Rings? That little green man going after the ring with his clutching long spidery fingers and his, and his covetous green eyes. My precious, he would say. I got to admit that there's a little bit of Gollum inside of me, and I can feel it kind of well up inside of me, right, sometimes, when I'm desiring something that I don't have. How many of you have a little Gollum inside of you? Anyone else feel like you've got an inner Gollum? We can, we can claim the inner Gollum today. <clears throat> Buddhists use the word, use the Pali word, tana, to describe the spiritual trap that I'm talking about. Tana is often translated as desire, but it literally means thirst. Our desire can become an unquenchable thirst. <laughs> this thirst, this, this craving, Buddhism teaches, is a primary cause of our suffering. <clears throat> Only by letting go of our craving can we find peace and contentment want what you have. You know, this ancient Buddhist teaching appears to have the weight of social science behind it, too. Study after study has shown that the correlation between happiness and material possession follows a bell curve, right? On one end, poverty and extreme financial hardship correlate to, to low levels of happiness. As income grows, so too does happiness, but only to a point, the point at which people's basic needs are met. After that, as income rises, happiness declines again. These studies appear to corroborate something that the Roman philosopher Seneca observed over 2,000 years ago. He said, it's not the person who has too little, but the person who craves more that is poor. <clears throat> of course, our attachments and our cravings aren't limited to money or material possessions. <clears throat> I remember when my son Nico was an infant and, and then a toddler, the thing I craved more than anything else in the world was solitude, <laughs> right? Me time. <clears throat> you know, back in the era that I called BC, before child, <laughs> I could pretty much count on a certain measure of peace and quiet in my life. Every morning, my alarm would go off at 6.30, and I'd, I'd wake up and make my coffee and settle down to about an hour of, of journaling and reading and, and prayer and meditation. 
It's how I began each day. Well, now my alarm clocks are my son and my puppy. <laughs> and once they go off, well, you know, it's a steady stream of need and demand and obligation. So I've tried to build a little solitude back into my life by visiting a little retreat center not too far from my home where I can go and be silent with others for one day a month, <clears throat> about four hours a month, really. All right? And a few months back, I went there on a beautiful fall day, and from the porch of this retreat lodge, I looked out over this peaceful golden meadow and toward a forest that was you know, just beginning to turn orange and red and... And I read on the porch and journaled by the fireplace, walked silently beside a still pond, and it was heaven. Until suddenly it wasn't. Just as I began to really savor the solitude I'd so longed for, I started craving more of it. I found myself in the middle of this retreat anxiously plotting scenarios to spend more time at the retreat center, <clears throat> come more often, stay for longer. Before I knew it, my contented solitude had soured into a nagging dissatisfaction, right? That little golem had appeared again. Isn't that crazy? But that's how our craving works. Like the touch of Midas, it can destroy just even life's greatest blessings and pleasures. So lately I've tried to shift my wishful thinking about more me time into thoughtful wishing. <clears throat> I read that Thich Nhat Hanh once advised a parent who was similarly desperate for some me time to think of his time with his child precisely as me time, rather than its opposite. And part of me, I'll admit, wanted to say, well, that's easy for a celibate monk to say, <laughs> right? <clears throat> but of course he's right. right. Want what you have. Count your blessings. Savor them. I want to close my message this morning with some words from the author and activist Alice Walker. Walker writes, to love what is plentiful as much as what is scarce. This could be our revolution. In our capitalist economy, value accrues to that which is scarce. <clears throat> the rarer the commodity, the more precious it becomes. Gold, silver, Cambridge real estate, you name it. <clears throat> In such an economy, the things that are plentiful are undervalued and often unappreciated. The air that we breathe, the sun that touches our face even on a cold winter's day, the sky that shelters us the love that we share. What if we decided to love these things as much as the things that are scarce or more? What if we decided to want the things we already have? It seems to me that then there'd be a lot of riches to go around. And that not only would we suffer less, we'd be more free. Free from all the ways that the market controls our attention and our desire and imposes its values on our lives and our bodies and our communities. Maybe Walker is right. Maybe it could be a revolution. So be free. Suffer less. Want what you have. Amen.
<clears throat> Will you join with me 